Good evening. We'll go ahead and get started tonight. Welcome everybody. Welcome our visitor. James has a friend that has visited with her with her sons tonight, so welcome. Um, anybody have any uh, testimonies or any prayer requests or any praise reports they want to share tonight? Sure.
When we get together, we always speak the word, so let's uh, speak the word together tonight. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Yes, Lord. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. Yes, Lord. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. John, if you'd come take an offering tonight for us, we appreciate it. An official. John gets to do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a guy. What a guy. What a guy. This is what happens when your wife doesn't show up. I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> Dance for your glory. We will dance, we will dance for your glory. 
skins are still getting stretched.
evidence tonight that by the power of your spirit, ministry goes forth. Every song that's sung, every testimony, Lord, every word spoken, it's your perfect will, Lord, to bless your people. We thank you for it tonight, Lord. We thank you for your grace and for the finished work of the cross, Lord. We bless your name and praise you. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Amen. Give him a hand clap tonight. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hope you didn't have any problems finding parking tonight. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. And uh, you may not believe this, but that's the first time John's ever used that clicker. Incredible, man. Incredible. handed it to me. I might have burned it up, but <laughs> you, get, you, you got the right understanding though, John. When you're in a hole, you just quit digging, right? <laughs> At some point, you just lay the shovel down. Anyway, hallelujah. Thank you, uh, visitors, for being here. God bless you. Appreciate you coming. And the rest of you? Yeah, well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Roberto. It's a Wednesday night in the summer in Des Moines. Hallelujah. Jesus is still on the throne. Praise God. Amen. Can't get too focused on who's not here. Praise God. We've got to focus on who is here, right? Amen. The Lord of Lords. Praise God. Amen. King of Kings. Thank you, Lord. God Almighty. Hallelujah. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, tonight I'm going to try to be brief, too, so you can get out here at a reasonable time. But uh, I want to talk to you about, I want to incorporate maybe some things from Revelation. We haven't talked about Revelation for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, we've a lot of people have these really distorted images of Revelation. We've talked about it some in the past, uh, several months back. But I want to kind of help us to see. We, need, we, we, we have eyes to see and ears to hear. Because of the Spirit of God, we have discernment. But we need to use it, and the way that we have to use that is to not be locked in on the traditional things that we've always heard. We talked about this a week ago, how, you know, you all of us have done this. We sing in a song and then realize we've been singing the wrong words for 10 years, you know, when we finally figure it out. And uh, kind of we do the same thing sometimes with Scripture. We think we know what it says simply because what somebody else said, and it's not always for sure that they knew what they were talking about, praise the Lord. And so uh, God's given us the Holy Spirit so that he can lead us and guide us. Uh, we're not trying to, you know, put anybody else down. It's just that I think that uh, God would like us to look at the Word of God as though we had no theology. You know what I'm saying? So we don't come dragging a bunch of baggage that really maybe has nothing to do with what God's trying to reveal to us. Praise the Lord. So it sounds kind of scary, but the good news is even if we screw up, we have the Holy Spirit to move us back on the right track. So you know, we can't really fail at this. We can just kind of do well or not do quite so well. Praise the Lord. But I think with the help of the Lord, we'll do just fine. Praise God. So I want to start, uh, Roberto, with uh, Romans chapter 4 and read verses 4 through 8. We're going to go to three different scriptures here at the beginning, and then we'll just kind of bounce around a little bit, touch a few points here. Kind of give us a new perspective. And I think, you know, the book of Revelation is supposed to be something that's a blessing to us. But how many of you have heard it preached and taught and tried to understand it, maybe some of yourself, only to be freaked out? I mean, it's not really that pleasant of a subject, the way it's been presented. I mean, you're thinking, you know, like bugs the size of Volkswagens flying around, horrible stuff happening to everybody, and it just looks really bad. But there's a whole lot more. You know, everything in the Bible, Old Testament is types and shadows, but God uses, you know, images and imagery get things across to us. He does it throughout the entire Bible, so I don't understand why it is then all of a sudden we get to the book of Revelation and we take everything literally. Where in the past, you've got oil, 
representing the Holy Spirit. You've got water, rivers representing the Holy Spirit. You've got all of these uh, instruments within the, the tabernacle pointing us to Jesus and revealing Christ to us. And then all of a sudden we get to the book of Revelation and we think that everything is exactly what it says. I mean, it is what it is, but it's trying to give us some truth that for some reason we, we twist it into being something really bizarre and scary. And to those that don't know the Lord, it is scary. But to us, it should give us peace. We should be, you know, we should be excited about the end times. Praise the Lord. We got a, you know, we got a good, hallelujah. We've got a good thing going. Praise God. All right. Uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Who is that? That's the one who trusts in the grace of God. Amen. Amen. By grace are you saved, not of works lest any man should boast. So he's saying there's two, there's, there's two contradictions here in terms of people that are in the world, and they're all either under grace or they're under the law. Even if they don't choose to be under the law, they're automatically under the law simply because they haven't chosen grace. So some choose it, but others are just stuck with it because they haven't come to Christ. Amen? All right. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Amen. Hallelujah. So you need the grace of God, but there are those who have received it, and it has no value to them because they're still operating in works. Praise God. We need to be focused on that, on grace, on the grace of God, on the finished work of Christ, beholding Jesus, you know. That's what makes us... Special. That's what separates us from the unbeliever. Amen? Or the religious, uh, you know, just fanatics, praise God. All right, now let's go to uh, the final verse here for the opening. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. I know these probably seem to be really totally random scriptures, <laughs> uh, but uh, praise the Lord. That's kind of the way my mind is working. Hallelujah. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. Praise the Lord. Okay, so we think about this mark of the beast, and that's where we're kind of going, but I want to show you there's a whole another uh, paradigm, if you will, uh, just a, a whole different dynamic here that I don't think we have normally looked at. But there, there's, there's uh, explanations throughout the Bible for this and, and revelations, I think, at the same time. So... So God's going to judge the wicked. We, we all know that, right? But he's also bringing them revelation. Praise God. That's what the law does. It brings them to the end of themselves. It helps them to see themselves for what they actually are. That's all the law is good for, because the law can't make you any better. The law is like looking into the mirror, right? You look in the mirror, and you see your hair is all messed up, but it won't comb it. Right? I mean, you see you got... Whatever, you need a shave, but it won't give you the razor. It won't do anything. It just, it just exposes whatever's there, right? That's what the Lord's talking about. Uh, here in Ecclesiastes, he says he's gonna, there's judgment to come for, uh, for the evil, for the wicked. But there's also revelation so that they can see themselves as beasts. Praise the Lord. Because everybody, any man, any human outside of God is a beast. Praise the Lord. And has the beast nature operating in them. Mm -hmm. Praise God. I know that sounds kind of 
you know, judgmental, but it's, it's Bible. If you're not in Christ, you're not alive. You're not a living spirit. You are a beast. Praise God. All right, let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 5, verses 20 and uh, 21, just to get some context here. Now, this is about Nebuchadnezzar. You know, Belshazzar is his offspring, and he's the, now the king. And, and these people, uh, they had taken, if you go back and read this, I won't do it for the sake of time tonight, but they had taken the, the uh, instruments and the things out of the tabernacle, out of the temple, years before when they took Israel into captivity, and they had been partying, you know, just dr getting drunk and doing all kinds of stuff. Those all represented Christ. You understand what I'm saying? So they were, they were vainly using the, the very things that were point, to point them to Christ. He, 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 you know, Daniel rebukes him for it. But prior to that, he, he tells him about what happened to his father or grandfather, whatever Nebuchadnezzar was to him. When his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride. He said, I, I am the great king. I'm, you know, God over everything. I'm doing it all. I'm in charge. I know what's got to be done. And uh, he was lifted up in pride. He was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and he appointed over it whomsoever he will. So God gave him a revelation of his true nature. He thought he was all that and a bag of chips. And God showed him that you are nothing. I'm the one. By, it's my grace that puts you where you are that allows you to have the favor and the blessing and the power and what have you. He had to have a revelation of who and what he really was before he could appreciate what God really was. Yeah. Amen? Now we talk about this all the time in the reverse, how we have to know our identity in Christ, and that's absolutely true. We have to know that we are the righteousness of God in Christ, regardless of how we look at any given moment. Mm -hmm. We may not be acting totally righteous, but we still are because of the finished work of Christ. Hallelujah. If, if uh, As I said Sunday, if we did nothing to be sinners other than to just to get born, because we were Adam's offspring. We have sin nature in us. Immediately we're sinners. And no matter how much good stuff we do in our life, we're still sinners. Until we come to Jesus. Once we have put faith in Christ, we become the righteousness of God in Christ. And so likewise, our bad behavior doesn't, doesn't change our identity or our position in God. Amen. I know that's hard for people to swallow, but come on. God's just. And you got born into this world. You were born a sinner. David said, in my mother's womb, I was a sinner. Hallelujah. I was born into this world a sinner, and I, th there's only one way out of it. No matter how good I try to be, no matter how nice I am, I have to be born again yes. to get a new nature, Amen. the righteous nature, rather than the beast nature. Amen? Amen? The problem is then, if I'm born again, I then have to renew my mind to these truths and stay focused on Christ and my righteousness in Him because if I'm looking at me, I'm seeing deviation. I'm seeing variation. I'm seeing good some days, not so good other days, looking pretty righteous at one moment and looking like a complete fool the next. Right? I mean, it happens to all of us, and that's why we have to stay focused on Christ. We have to stay focused on Him and His finished work that declares us to be righteous in spite of whatever we might be doing from one moment to the next. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Likewise, the sinner has to have a revelation of his condition too, or he has no reason to come to Christ. Right. And that's what God does. He reveals to them this beast nature. He gives them a revelation as well as judgment. It would be unfair of God just to judge people if he didn't somehow give them a revelation. And the Bible says he puts it in the hearts of all men to know him. Right. So everybody... There, nobody's going to have an excuse that, gee, I never heard about you. You know, there, everybody has it in their heart to know the Lord. There's a, there's a hunger there for everybody. And God is the one that put it there. So, anyway, Nebuchadnezzar here, he had the concept that I'm the ruler of my own destiny. 
I just do what I do. I, got, I, can, I can make things happen. I can make it good. I can you know, do whatever I want to do because I have this ability within myself. It's the religious kind of mindset that you know, I can do enough good things that I'll be accepted, that God will show me special favor, those kind of mentalities, you know, that kind of attitude, right? right. So let's look here at James <clears throat> chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Okay, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us list, lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Mm -hmm. Meaning, not, you know, that, well, you know, I'm, I'm so humble and, you know, I'm, or I'm just arrogant. But talking about when we depend on God, that's humbling ourselves. That's putting ourselves in a position where we get even more grace. Mm -hmm. When we think that we're going to do things on our own to cause things to happen... That's, that's this Nebuchadnezzar kind of spirit of, you know, I'll help God out a little bit here. I mean, I think I know what needs to be done in this situation, and, and it always leads, amen, to failure. So Nebuchadnezzar was lifted up in pride. And what happens with us is we get, you know, I think somebody was talking about it, you know, when, when things are going fairly well. You know, it's one thing when you're in a real crisis, it's easy, you know, to cry out to God and, and expect help or depend on him for help. But when things are not going bad, we have a tendency to kind of just don't bother God with this thing. I mean, I think I've got it figured out. You know, everything's going pretty well anyway. We think that we can do it. We kind of start doing our own thing and put the in Jesus name on the back of it. You know, it's like, okay, so praise the Lord. After we did it without any, you know, direction or guidance from God or anything else. So, to kind of make some sense out of this. There was a time, and in fact, still today, I hear people say this, but where they believed that this, uh, the beast was some electronic system. It's the UPC, not the United Pentecostal Church, <laughs> although we have heard some of that as well, but, uh, but the universal pricing code. You know, those little bars that are on everything that you buy anymore. I mean, I've heard this for a long time, yeah. And so this number, it's on there because, you know, it's about buying and selling. That's what they try to project anyway. So your card or your number is tattooed on your right hand or your forehead. That's nice. I see tattoos on necks and everything else. I guess that's no big deal, especially if it's the barcode. But, I mean, that's what they're saying and, and believing many people. And so then you, you, you just stick your hand out there or your forehead or whatever, and they scan it and deduct X number of credits or dollars or whatever out of your account, and that's transferred to whatever the business is, and then you get your merchandise, food, whatever it might be, right? Anybody else heard this, or am I just like living on another planet? Okay, so according to a lot of people, then that's the beast, or that's the mark of the beast, right? So what, this is why we're looking at something that has to do with buying and selling. But I want you to look at this in, the, uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Does anybody have an Amplified? I forgot to bring the Amplified Bible up here. Suzanne, would you read that out of the Amplified if you have it? 3, 5? Uh, yes, Colossians 3 and 5. And, and we're going to read 6 too. So. But I, want, I want, to, want you to hear it out of the uh, Amplified. That's the point I want to make out of that. We've, we've made it all about the, the particular behaviors. But he's more interested in the fact that it's we're, what we're doing there is deifying ourselves, making ourselves God. You understand what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's what pride does. That's what flesh does. That's what, that's what we're doing when we say, God, I don't need your help. I got this. We're, it's, it's deification. It's idolatry. Amen? All right, let me show you. All right, then... Uh, 
Colossians 3 and 6, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. For what? For the individual stuff that they're doing? No. For the self-deification. Right. You understand? For the idolatry. Self-centeredness. Praise God. Amen. So the, the beast that is worshipped in Revelation chapter 13. Let's go there, Revelation 13, 1. Because the sea is symbolic of people over and over. Right? I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. All right? So the, the beast that is worshipped there is people. It's, it's what we just read in Colossians. Mm -hmm. self. Idolatry, self-deification. Right. Amen. I mean, you got to, I know it's, when, when you've been railroaded down the track for so long thinking one thing, sometimes you start talking outside of that and it sounds like, where did that come from? But that's Bible. That's, that's actually using the Bible to, to define the Bible or to, or to uh, uh, interpret the Bible, if you will. Amen? Amen? Because look at James chapter uh, 1 and verse 6. Let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Mm -hmm. All right? Now keep that in mind. Let's go to Revelation 12 and verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the seal and of the seal, excuse me, and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Okay, so the devil is attacking based on these scriptures, the sea dweller and the inhabitant of the earth. Now, how many of you know when we're born again, we are seated in heavenly places. This is God's idea of where we are. Amen. We are in Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ, seated in heavenly places, far above all principality, powers, and so on and so forth. But there are still earth dwellers. Right. Amen. There are still sea dwellers. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. And that's what he's talking about. The devil is attacking both the sea dweller and the inhabitant of the earth. Mm -hmm. And See, the land dweller doesn't just live on the earth geographically. Right. This is a spiritual condition. Because that's all this Bible is about, is spirit and flesh. Mm -hmm. Amen? So the one who dwells in the dust of man is the earth dweller. Right. Got it? Let's, let's look at this. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. Now, I think this is really interesting because you see it all through the Bible, but you don't recognize it initially. But in Genesis 3, 7 is where God is creating Adam, and he says, The eyes of them were both open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together. No, that's not it. Is it? Is it? Okay, go to 2, 7. Maybe it's 2, 7. Yeah, I'm sorry. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. How did man become a living soul? He wasn't a spirit when God created him. He was dust. He was created out of the dust, and then God breathed, into him and he became a spirit being right. with a body. Right. God, the breath of God is the word of God. Right. I mean, you see it over and over and over throughout. So what he's saying is you, you've got just a carnal being here and then God breathes the word into him and now he's a spirit. Now he's connected. He's God's offspring. Amen. Praise the Lord. So this is when he talks about the the uh, the, the inhabitants of the earth and the sea dwellers. Well, the inhabitants of the earth are the people that are in Adam. Right? Not born again, not in the second Adam or the last Adam, but in Adam who are lost. I mean, they're still unsaved. Right? All right, then the sea dweller is the double-minded person. Right? Ta every wave tossed with every wave. So they're, they're the people who may be believers... You understand what I'm saying? They're believers, but they're not. So you can be a believer and not be born again. Right. I mean, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Right. The devil believes, right. but he's not born again right. because he's never acted on that belief. Mm -hmm. 
in Jesus' day, how many think of the people that came to him and they believed on him, but they weren't saved because Jesus hadn't died and, and, and been buried and resurrected. They were believers, but they weren't born again. So that's what the double-minded is the people that all of us know him. I mean, we've talked to him and, oh, yeah, I believe in God. And, you know, and then poo-poo everything else. And, ah, well, but there's many ways to God, you know, and just any old thing will work. And you see what I'm saying? They're not, they're not focused on Christ and his finished work. They're looking just at religion in general or just that there is a God up there somewhere and he's not bothered with me, right? All right, so let's look at this now because we know that there's a child of promise. And we are his seed. Yes. We are heirs and joint heirs with Christ, brothers uh, of his. He was the promised seed to come, right? right? But he comes out of the original promised seed, which was who? No, no, the promise, the first, the promised seed after Adam, because he promises that one will come, right? So we've got Abraham's, got Ishmael. God says that's not the promise. Then. Okay, he, he's going to be a big deal. He's going to have a huge family, a lot of offspring, but he's not the promised one. Isaac is the promise, and through him all of the world will be blessed, right? There you go. Let's look at this, okay? Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, first of all, let's go there because we never covered that, but this has got to do again with what God says to the enemy, right? You already know Adam is dust. Right. We've got people that are dust dwellers, hallelujah, earth dwellers. And he said, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, but upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of your life. Wow. See, the enemy is going about seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. Who is he devouring? Dust. dust people. People that are not in Christ. He's got a free reign. He can devour them anywhere, anytime, however. Because they don't even acknowledge that he exists half the time. Right. Praise the Lord. Okay, uh, so they're eat he's eating dust. Not dirt, notice, it's but it's carnality. It's the carnal person, right? Yeah. And the sea dweller is the double-minded one. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Okay, not always necessarily carnal. They might believe in God. They might believe in religion, but they just don't believe that Jesus is the way, right. the truth, and the light. Praise the Lord. All right, now, Genesis chapter 22 and verse uh, 17, Roberto. And we're going to look at two different things here so you can see where this is coming from. Now, this is God speaking to Abraham. He says, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. All right, now look at Genesis chapter 13 and verse 16. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Now, look, remember, we've got two offspring here. Right. And I believe what the scripture is showing us here is that the seed of the stars in the heavens talking about Isaac. That's where we reside. Amen. And the seed of the sand, or the sea, or the dust here, is Ishmael. Yes. Yes. Huge. He's the whole Arab, you know, billions. Billions of people. But they're, they're not children of God. They're not seated in heavenly places. They're carnal. Amen. So you've got two natures. You've got the heavenly and the earthly. That's throughout the Bible. I mean, it starts from the very beginning. Amen? Christ nature, beast nature, right. or heavenly or carnal. Right. That's, the, that's what's being revealed here in Revelation. Right. That's this beast coming up out of the sea is not some cyclops with a horn or a you know, unicorn-looking lizard of some kind. It's the people. It's people that are ungodly, people that have no connection with God. Praise God. So you see the devil, he comes down to devour the carnally minded and the double minded. How do we know that? Because we know the church gets raptured. Right. The heavenlies are in the heavenly. Mm -hmm. 
And the enemy comes, and those that have been worshiping, whether they understood it or not, are now at his mercy. And he has no mercy. He's going to come and destroy a third of mankind or whatever it is, you know? Right? right. So he's coming down, and he's going to devour the carnally minded and the double minded, the sea dweller, the sand dweller, right? right? Out of these people is where the beast arises. Right. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Galatians uh, 5. Verses 15 through 18. This is a scripture I've read a lot and never did quite get it, but I think I understand it a little bit better now uh, than I have in the past. Amen? But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, that's talking about within us, our unrenewed mind is still capable of doing all kinds of stuff, but it's also talking about two different manifestations of humanity. The righteous and the unrighteous, the godly and the ungodly, mm -hmm. the carnal and the spiritual. So he's saying, operate from, which is what he's talking about in Galatians chapter 3, he's saying, operate from where you were born again. Don't operate from that old at Adamic nature, operate from what got you into this in the first place, which was grace. Walk in that spirit of grace. Make that your identity. That's your protection. You get it? I mean, that's, you understand? That is what protects us. Amen. Amen? Praise the Lord. So, what's the area of the beast's authority? The carnal mind. The natural mind. I mean, you turn on the news and you hear stuff and you think, my God, have these people ever read a Bible? Have they ever heard a message? Of, you know, do they know anything about God at all? Because they're saying stuff and you're thinking, my God, they'd have to be complete idiots to not recognize this. And then you forget that there are hundreds of thousands, millions of people who don't know God. Or know him as some general kind of off in the cloud someplace, uh, phantom. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. So it's our unrenewed thinking. Right. Get it? That's what the issue is here. That's the carnal mind, the unrenewed thinking. See, it means that the mark of the beast is similar to the seal of God. Right. You know, I mean, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, we can go there, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, he talks about being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, you can't see it. I'm sealed. You're sealed if you're a believer. But I don't see nothing on your forehead or your right hand. But yet we think that because of this, there's going to be, it'll be easy to tell because they're going to have tattoos on them. It's like a can of Van Camp's beans going down the thing. And we know you. We got you. you know, we figured you out. Praise the Lord. So here it is. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, which is grace, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And God says, I put my name in your forehead. So we're sealed in Christ. Hallelujah. These people have a seal. Mm -hmm. And that's what this, it's not something that you see. It's not some tattoo. It's an unrenewed mind. It's an unregenerated. It's the carnal person. And even though we can't see him, God knows the difference. It's a spiritual mark. Amen? Praise the Lord. So the seal of God is the mind of Christ. That's what makes us so different. We see things, and I mean, I know we have weak, time, weak moments where we don't always immediately click to what God's trying to do because we're looking at circumstances and situations. But ultimately, and the more our minds are renewed, the quicker we look at the, the obstacle or the, the problem or the whatever it is, and we immediately turn to the Word of God. Okay, I feel sickness in my body. By His stripes, I'm healed. Amen. You know, the bills come in, not that money in the checkbook, but my God supplies all of my need according to His riches and glory. See what I mean? Our minds are... So we're, we look like idiots. We, 
we sound like idiots to somebody who's carnally minded because they're dealing with nothing but logic and facts. And we're dealing with something spiritual, something supernatural, something that is not visible but can be made manifest, and it's made manifest through faith by what we believe and by what we speak, right? So this is, this is the, the, uh, the seal of God for, for Christians. It's, it's the mind. It's having the mind of Christ. And that is an operation of the Spirit working in us. Praise the Lord. Because even, think about this, even when you didn't really know the Bible and you'd be confronted with things, something in your heart would say, well, God can handle it. Even though you didn't necessarily know what promise that was or where the scripture was, you still trust God, right? You still go to the Lord. Well, they're not. They don't. You know, I mean, that's the, that's the difference. And, of course, the more you know about God's character, the more you understand his love and his grace, the more confidence you have and the greater your faith can operate. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So uh, the flip side of this is the mark of the beast, which is a reprobate mind, right. a mind who doesn't connect with God at all. The carnal mind is enmity with God. It's right. like a reprobate mind because it doesn't get any benefit from the grace of God. The grace of God is vain, in vain for them as far as they're concerned because it does, they, don't, they benefit, they profit nothing from it. Praise the Lord. Okay, so how do we overcome? Hallelujah. That's it. Revelation 19, 19. We'll see. Well, let's start with 19, 13. I'm sorry. We'll just read 19, 13, then jump to 19. In whom he also trusted, okay, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Praise the Lord. All right. Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beasts of the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Hallelujah. So he makes war against the beast with his sword that comes out of his mouth. The word of God. How do we make war against the beast? With the word of God. Which is what we've been talking about, which is exactly what we're doing here at the very beginning of the service and every service. Not just to be, you know, repetitious. But to remind us that that word, when we declare that word, devils tremble. Right. If we believe it. Right. I'm a believer. These signs follow me. Yeah. I lay hands on the sick. I'm, it's not because I've got so many degrees or I'm the pastor and I lay hands. No, it's, I'm a believer. If I'm a believer, I lay hands on the sick. I cast out devils. I do it because I'm a believer. I do it because I have a mind, the mind of Christ. I've been sealed with this purpose. Hallelujah. Amen? Okay, let's go back to Revelation uh, chapter 2 and verse 20. Hallelujah. Revelation 2 and 20. And we're almost done here, but praise the Lord. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Okay, a lady said, boo! <laughs> Amen, but this is just about a spirit which calleth itself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now remember what we read originally in Colossians. That's why I say this isn't so much about a, you know, a naughty act, a dirty deed. It's, there's another thing going on here that is far more serious. Fornication is operating outside of covenant. Period. Now we know in marriage it would be outside of marriage, but, but that's just a covenant. And that's where that actually comes from in the first place it's operating outside of covenant in other words operating outside of our relationship with God in other words operating outside of grace amen can you see the bigger picture here to when, it, when we're talking about revelation it's a confirmation an affirmation of everything else that the Bible is telling it's not like a new thing all of a sudden something really weird is going on out here but it's actually a confirmation of everything else that the Bible is trying to teach us. Amen. We should rejoice. Oh, blessed is the man who reads these words. Well, now that was tough to swallow for a long time. It, you didn't feel blessed after you read Revelation. You felt freaked out and confused. Right? But when you understand it in the context that God intended it, now it's a whole other ballgame. Hallelujah. We've got something to be excited about. We are in covenant. 
We are in the grace covenant. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16. Now, we're the seed, the promised seed, right? Yes. Through whom God's going to bless the earth and all his glory will be revealed, right? Yes. Lest there be any fornicator. That word pops up again here. Mm -hmm. Somebody out, operating outside of covenant, right? right? Or profane person as Esau. What was Esau's problem? Operating outside the covenant. Amen. Who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Praise the Lord. Don't sell grace. Don't give up grace for something you can do, for works, for effort, for, for you know, I'm like, look at how good I am and what I've done. And, you know what I mean? Nothing wrong with doing good, but if we do it out of the what it's going to get me or do it out of the why he has blessed me so. You know, that's what he's talking about here. That's the, that's the real picture between Esau and Jacob. Look, Jacob was a jerk. We know he was. He was a liar. He was a deceiver, right? But he depended on God. He trusted God. And God said, whoa, he's a prince, Israel. I'll bless everything you set your hand to, you know. And through you come the tribes of Israel and so on and so forth, right? All right, let's close with this. Galatians chapter 2, verses 16 through 21, and we'll finish. Praise the Lord. 16 through 21. Yeah, 16 through 21. Lest there be any fornicator, okay, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Right. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. In other words, back under the law, because that's where you, I mean, if you're not under the law, there is no sin. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No sin can be accounted or, or you know, put on you, right? So, uh, not by works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ... We ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Amen. Hallelujah. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate yes. the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Right. Don't frustrate it. Right. Don't sell it out. Mm -hmm. Amen. Trust God. No matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation, don't worry about the devil. Right. Stay focused on God. He's coming. Who he's coming after, he can't touch you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. God has, got, God has got more than a hedge around you. He, he, he says, I am your shield and exceeding great reward. Amen. Praise the Lord. Doesn't get any better than that. He's stopping anything from getting to you that's negative, and he's opening up avenues for every positive blessing to come flowing to you. Amen. That's the God we serve. That's a good God. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the God. That's Jesus. Amen. Let's give him a hand clap. Praise the Lord. So the next time you're talking to some sinner, try not to say beast. Praise the Lord. Amen. Be nice. Hallelujah. Love them, in, love them right on into the kingdom. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thanks for being here tonight. Lord bless you. Have a great week. And hope we'll see you back here Sunday along with everybody else. Praise God. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord.